of the word itself is sir. But there is one singular thought that appears to be present in most all ideas. That is, it refers to east and rising sun. And of course, that means in many people's minds that it has to do with resurrection. It's connected there too. But let's well, always keep in mind there is a way to seek right unto a man. For the end there are always ahead. We must, must have a thus simple Lord, whatever we really practice, if it is to be acceptable to Jesus Christ. The observance of Easter actually represents a convergence of three, three particular events. First of all, the Hebrew Passover which we read in the Old Testament. It was celebrated in the, in the month of Nisan. And that happens to be the first month of the Hebrew calendar. And it always fell in the spring of the year. The next is the commemoration of the actual crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. Remember it happened to take place during the feast of the Hebrew Passover. Then the third, as I said, all these converge to give us what basically they would call Easter. The third is a pagan festival of spring, which fell on the equinox on the world equinox of March 21st. And this particular pagan festival embodied the worship of the goddess among the Saxons in whose honor sacrifices were offered. And it is the merging of these three events that have become associated with the unauthorized, unauthorized by the New Testament of Christ, festival of the resurrection, which was celebrated each year at the time of the Jewish Passover. Now keep that in mind. It's been 2,000 long years since about since the Lord walked this earth. And since the New Testament was fully revealed, confirmed by miracles, signs, and wonders to be from heaven and not from men, and just said that. But the New Testament itself, born various times, it had a great emphasis the fact that the people would believe the truth of the New Testament and go about to the old folks. <laughs> And in the first 300 or so years after the first century, it's known as the time of the great apostasy. People were leaving the truth. They did it incrementally, but they left it. And out of that apostasy, there formed what we know as the Roman Catholic Church. I will say this again. You should not say, because it's wrong. The Roman Catholic Church is an apostate church. I say something that's apostate means it used to be there. But it's all the way. The Roman Catholic Church is not nothing. It's formed out of the apostasy. Now, the day on which Easter was to be observed, the history of it has been much disputed. The first great church council called by Constantine and Nicaea was in 325 A.D. And that, and that council decided that Sunday was the day in which Easter would be observed. No particular Sunday, but it was a Sunday. You have to come down to the 7th century to see that room finally, about hundreds of years after it was really declared to be a The same method of calculation is used today. Easter Sunday is determined to be the first Sunday after, the first full moon after, the first day of spring, March 21st. Each Sunday may fall anywhere between March 21st and April 25th. That's a year and 35 days. And this explains why Easter is on a different Sunday every year instead of on the same Sunday. Same month every year. I find it really interesting that people could come up with that hundreds of years ago and stick to it in case they were by. It shows you how much people say, I was never about it. 
It's right there underneath. It's been around a long time. Yes, it's the Word of God. Yes, it's here, here to guide me. But I really like this. I can't get that straight. Well, I get this straight. It just, it just says, man, I've always been told about the fact that I do things out like Now, many other occasions are connected with the celebration of Easter. And this may be where you find the study, if you find it interesting at all. More interesting because Easter we think of as one time. But there's a whole whole group of things that are involved in what we would call the Easter season. There's Lent, L-E-N-T, or the Lenten season. And that's applied to the 40 days of fasting that precedes Easter Sunday. That word, L-E-N-T, Lent, signifies the spring fast or Lenten fast. Time. It's observed in commemoration of Jesus' fast in the wilderness for a period of 40 days. Now, of course, you can read your New Testament for Scripture. The fact of the matter is, you can't because it's not there. Then you'll notice it begins on what's called, quote, Ash Dash Wednesday. Ash Wednesday. Now, this is 40 days before Easter. Sunday's excluded. It's supposed, supposed to be a time of penitence, penitence where one shows sorrow for sin and, and their need for forgiveness. It's, it's a time when observers prepare for Easter by abstaining from certain foods and activities. Again, you read that in the Bible, didn't you? It's in the last of the Testament of Christ, it? Of course it's not. The Bible gives no authority as to anything concerning this event. And wouldn't it be so easy if people said, well, I have no authority for it. So we would do it. That'd be so simple. Then you need that on that, but we do it. Then there's Ash Wednesday. And that's the first day of what I said earlier, is Lent. And it came from a custom observed by people expressing their humiliation. And, and they would appear in, as we read in the Old Testament, sackcloth and ashes, which was typical custom at that time for hundreds of years, where people in dire straits and terrible sorrow and plight would actually do that to demonstrate their sorrow. In some churches, ashes burned for the preceding years on Sunday is blessed by the priests. And used to mark the cross on the foreheads of the members of the congregation. We probably have seen some folks with that idea. And this is supposed to remind people to begin their Lenten penance in the Holy Spirit. And uh, like the other observances that we're studying, there's no authority for the scriptures to observe such a day. I want you to say that. Because I want you to know this all came from the likes and dislikes of man and the will of man. It's super dead. Then there's Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is the Sunday before Easter. It marks the beginning of what many call Holy Week. Or you may have heard it, Passion Week. This Sunday, that Palm Sunday, is supposed to honor Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Where palm branches were used to align the road, the people had the Hosea blessings that come from the name of the Lord, John 12, 12 through 15. The first celebration of this was not known until the fourth century. 300 long years after the revelation of God's word was complete. Thus, there's nothing in the Bible about that either. You've probably heard these next and didn't know what we were going to come from that background. Monday, Thursday, M A U N D A Y dash Thursday. Monday, Thursday. It's also called Holy Thursday. This is the Thursday before Easter. And it's supposed to recall to one's mind our Lord's last meeting with the twelve apostles in the upper room. Now, in some places, the priest will wash the feet of 12 members of the congregation to show that Jesus washed the disciples' feet. Later on in another study, we'll have more to say about, quote, foot washing, unquote. Then we know Good Friday. You know how I first learned about Good Friday? 
And that's what your dad needs. Now, why? And other seeds too in your garden. But I never thought as a child to say, why do you have this Friday at the time you can plant your garden? Well, this is the Friday before Easter. And of course, it's supposed to observe the death of Jesus on the cross and along with his suffering for sins. However, according to the New Testament of Christ, Christians observe the Lord's death every first day of the week in the worship of sins and saints. Not simply once a year, actually, per se. It's rather amazing to me that people can remember this about human doctrine that they can't find in the New Testament, but they can't remember Acts 27 as the time the Holy Spirit had Paul assembled with the saints to do exactly what the New Testament required when he came to worship. And then about those words of the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. Well, of course, all that had to do with the resurrection. That's a good time of that meeting. Amazing. Sad, but it's amazing. Then there's Holy Saturday. Of course, that's the day before Easter. And it's supposed to be a day of solemn vigil. So you're waiting. You're waiting. And there are some churches who hold vigil services, which all include the baptism of new members. Now, how that fits in with that, I don't know. Because many of these don't even believe baptism is their salvation anyway. So I'm almost here again to say, do you not see that this is all set up to suit what people think and what they like? Many times this leads up to a dramatic moment in which all the lights are put out, <coughs> leaving everyone in the dark, as if they were already in the dark about the truth. And the priest will light a tall candle which represents the risen Christ. He then will light the candle along to the Members. And that's supposed to symbolize a lot of Christ going out to, to the world. And many of these vigil services will last till dawn. Now you're doing something you're familiar with, which ends in a sudden rise to service. It will be held next Sunday morning, I assure you, but it may not be with all the trappings of this, because what I'm reading to you basically here is coming from Roman Catholicism. And they're the ones that basically have got it all together out of great apostasy and they formulated what it is. And many denominations have a special sunrise service on this morning. Where is that time? I mean, there's one time on the first of the week in worship to have one dedicated to this is not found in the New Testament. Then one that is interesting. The songs you can read. This is the secular. You can read the whole field's ball. All that stuff. Wearing, Wearing the new clothes. <laughs> and that includes that Easter one. Or is it? We want to say, is that your Easter grace? <clears throat> so they do that on Easter Sunday. And that's an established tradition in some places. You might remember the church. And I like to say something about this. A person can engage in something that has no direct connection with it being a religious holiday because it's lost all the time. The sad part about it is people do that, they don't want it, they don't know where it came from, they do it. Probably the idea that I get that money out of my husband would buy it. So it works real well, he's afraid to say that about it. New clothes represented then, new life offered for the death of the resurrection of Christ. Now, when's the last time you read that in your chest? You won't read it. It's not that. That's what somebody thought of you would do with it. You know what I thought? You said, man, and he almost walked away and didn't do what I thought. Easter eggs. Well, they've long been a part of the Easter season. Eggs have always been considered, especially among the pagans of years and years ago, to be a symbol of life and creation. About the giving the long colored eggs was customary throughout the East all years ago. And purple was the color of kings and nobility. The ancient time, in ancient times, this dye was very expensive. And then it was a seller of purple. She would only be dealing with very wealthy people, but only very wealthy people could buy that. 
So the rich had it. And then there was the color yellow. Yellow. One yellow. What's the color? What's the sign? It's radiant. And it's brilliant. And then white. White was the color of purity. That's the reason women marry four or five times a divorce and they still wear white. It's the whole thing. I have no problem with uh, a virgin wearing a white dress. Wait, let the least represent what it all is talking about to represent, rather than make something out of it. But it's all tradition anyway. Now, that inspired church history, I say uninspired church history, the egg symbolized the immature hope of the resurrection. But where did you get that? But you might say this gets better. Rabbits. You come to me to cop the tail, hopping it down the bunny tail. Give me how many pieces are going its way. They're connected with the observance of Easter because they are, everybody probably knows this, associated with fertility and spring. Their ability to multiply and to raise rabbits, what ability that is. And it brings new life to the world. So what you do with that new life comes joy and hope. Now, tradition, that means we're going back to what's been said, we can't be absolutely sure sometimes, says the Easter Bunny brings a basket of multicolored eggs. And I think I can safely say that never happened. And he, he it, her, whoever it is, brings that on the night before Easter. And then these are hidden in the house in the garden or both for the children to find the next morning. I have no problem with people do that just as a second holiday and have fun. But I don't think they know something that comes from them that originally was all involved in the full scale celebration of a religious holiday. And they borrow all of that from Let me say this about the Roman Catholic Church. When Roman Catholicism went into any particular place, Let's say, the Nordic countries, such as Norway, they didn't want you even over there. Or when they went into Ireland, or when they went into France, or when they went into South America. They went into places originally that was as pagan as it could be. They worship idols, they have their own particular idols, they have their particular uh, fantasy, whatever. They believed in them deeply, just like the Romans did, and all that stuff we read of in the New Testament, and how doctors worship them back in the Old Testament. Mid-East and their worship. But here's what they would do. It would be a festival of some god. And what they would do was simply remove whatever god that was and replace it with a saint according to Roman Catholicism and definition of saint. Or a certain holy day pointing up to certain things. And they would simply convert that into some semblance of what they considered to be. Christianity. And that's the reason you have variations of holy days among all these different nations. Because they adapted themselves to the paganism that was there. You may not be aware of it, but you go to England and you see these uh, cathedrals, sometimes churches even, cathedrals in particular, that are a thousand years old or older. And usually they're built on a spot that goes back to where there was a church, it goes back to where there was a Roman temple. And that Roman temple many times was built for either a local pagan site of the people of that time. And you can follow that I don't know today to find a lot of stuff like that. That's the way Roman Catholicism works. They won't deny it. I'm not putting something in their mouth. They just get they simply take the local pagan views and let it be represented by something to do with Christianity. Well, there's another one, pretzels. Pretzels, known as hot cross buns, are supposed to be Lenten food. The Saxons, under their goddess of spring, were eating what was called wheat cakes. It's believed that from this ritual came the idea of hot cross buns or pretzels. The buns had a cross of icing on top, and the pretzels brought to mind a person praying with their arms folded across the chest. 
in some places they're given to the poor to eat during this so-called pandemic season. Then there's uh, what's called Wit, W-H-I-T dash, Wit dash Sunday. And you've probably heard this in maybe some old English writing, Whitsuntide, Whitsuntide. Light Sunday, or Pentecost Sunday. It comes 50 days after Easter, and it marks the actual end of the whole Easter season. And it's a commemoration of Pentecost Day, and the one we read of in Acts 2, when the Holy Spirit descended among the apostles, and of course the church started. And newly baptized people would wear robes of white on that day as it degenerated into what we're talking about the whole Easter celebration. Easter and its associated festivals or its festivities. It is considered by the masses to be really the greatest. It, 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 it's the Christmas of the world. It's considered by the greatest, by the masses to be the greatest of the festivals among Christian so-called people. And as you well know, some will quote go to church unquote on that Sunday. And they won't go over any other time, but it might be Christmas. Of course, you all know about Jesus. I say that to the chief. The teaching they might It's solid. The authority of Christ does not approve of that. Now, now does the Bible claim Easter Sunday is of great significance, greater significance than any other Sunday of the year? Well, let me make a suggestion. Search diligently every word of the New Testament before you answer that question. But I tell you what your answer will be. It's not that. The facts bear testimony that Easter and its seasonal observance stand without any Bible authority whatsoever. There is no direct statement. There is no example. There is nothing implied anywhere in the Scripture that will authorize the observance of this day with any religious significance. In the New Testament, Christians observed, that is, they commemorated the death of Christ. In the first day of the week, worship assembly is one of the five acts of worship. It's just that way. Acts 27, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. Now, let me pause here and say New Testament Christianity has authorized in the words of Christ simple and clear. The New Testament worship is easy to ascertain and understand. What it demands of us is the utmost concentration of our minds and spirits upon the very act. Yet the simplicity of it is what magnifies it. Since the celebration of Easter came about after the time of the apostles in the New Testament Revelation, we may only conclude that it has no place at all, no place at all, in the worship of New Testament Christians by the silence. There are no special occasions. There are no seasons. There are no dates. There are no days that have any religious significance for the Lord's church and Christians. So I say, what about Sunday? Brethren, the thing we do on Sunday is not Sunday as if we're keeping the Sabbath. The things we do on the first day of the week, Sunday, are the things that are authorized, not the day itself. But it's the thing we do on that day. And he located it on that day. And he specified that day for certain things to be done. But the day itself is not like the Sabbath. And it's wrong to talk about uh, Sunday as the Christian Sabbath. Peter said, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. The oracles of God are silent on them. There's no authority for them. And we're just simple then on each first day of the week to speak the children of God and worship God according to the teaching of the New Testament in the city. It says every week is the first day. Every week is the first day. It doesn't seem to be too profound to figure that out. The whole church assembles for worship as it's authorized in the last of the testament of our Lord and our Savior and our Sovereign King. And that includes singing, Ephesians 5.19, praying, Acts 2.47. I've already said the Lord's Supper, Acts 20, verse 7, and giving of our means. 
First Corinthians chapter 16, 1 and 2. And then preaching the gospel of Christ. Studying the word of God. That's what he said. So every Sunday is the same as the Sunday which comes before it. And the Sunday which comes after it. Any first day is no more special than any other. It is man, where the problem has always been. It is man and not God who makes some days or times more important and special than others. But when man does that, he does so at his own peril. We must act only about the authority of Christ as it's set out in the words of Christ, but we have no assurance of what we do being accepted to God. Now, before I leave this, someone no doubt about talk about the King James Version of the word Easter. And some have uh, referred to those who use the King James Version as Easter Bunny preachers. Because that word is used in Acts 12 4. I suppose they seek to cast reflection and doubt on the reliable, time tested King James Version of 1611. And of course, that covers those who use it. For some reason, they feel threatened, I suppose, by and want to go by the wayside because in their thinking, it's old, it's old, it's old, it's old. Obsolete, it's archaic, it's better to have something new. So immediately it was like you can't understand that. I know no better way to cause people not to understand the Bible than to tell them every day all day long can't understand it. Now the salvation world, especially Roman Catholicism, has done that for a long time. Don't read, can't understand it, that's the obligation of the clergy. You'll tell you what it says. And you'll hear the denomination people say, well, it means this to you, it means that to somebody else, it means this to me, and then they go along. And that just simply says, why study? And then the Bible's full of material right and left. Same study, study, study. Same to me, 2.15. Could it be because it refutes the numerous errors found in their favorite perversion that people don't want to deal with the time and truth? The King James Version. It's not to be down new versions. It's just to mean have at least a legitimate reason for opposing the verse if you're going to do it. If the worst thing they can say about the King James Version is that it uses the word Easter, then stand on pretty good ground because you say a whole lot more about a lot of other new versions that are supposedly designed to give you a clear understanding of the King James Version again. So what can be said about the word Easter it appears in the King James Version. Acts 12, verse 4 reads, And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison, and delivered him to four ordinances of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. The Greek word translated Easter in this verse, if it had really been translated, it would say Passover referring to the annual Jewish Passover. It, it is all 28 places that that word appears in the King James Version of the New Testament. So the New King James Version uses the word Passover, Acts 4. I think sometimes people forget that the New King James Version, though there's been several, several revisions of them, is the still the King James Version. And it has Passover. So why is it translated Easter in Acts 12 fold in the King James? Number one, I know this. When they rendered the Greek word that should be Passover in English, they didn't render it into Easter. They just substituted Easter. Now the best I've been able to find out over the years why they did it view of my good translation it actually is throughout it is that they were concerned about the people of England knowing what Passover was. And the people of England knew very, very well after hundreds of years of Roman Catholicism that exactly what these two was. They should have done it. They failed in their task as translators and all the translator meaning. When they put Easter in the place of Passover, they could have put it in a footnote or something so people could understand. But they did not. 
And there's a possibility that the one reason they did because they believed in Easter. That's <laughs> why. Who is head of the Church of England? The King of England. Who authorized the translation of the King James? Version. They pulled this kind of stunt on the less obvious when it came to baptizo. They didn't translate baptizo. They transliterated it. Because baptizo, they knew very well meant to plunge, to immerse. But the Church of England does not plunge and immerse. It does not bury somebody in baptism. Who's the head of the Church of England? The sovereign king who commissioned them, but is way behind the translation of this new version of 1611, the King James. So they basically said, we'll make a new word. Baptize, or baptism, and we won't put burial or immerse. And then they pretty much say, you figure it out, but we won't cross the key. Well, you can easily prove with baptism because it's comes from that word when you go back and read point out to these converse. But then you can't from the English scriptures. Bury with him in baptism. Or 6 3 and 4, Colossians 2 12. So that's not so much a big problem. But they just did not translate when it came to putting Easter in. They did it, I think, because they wanted people to know what time of year the Passover was when Jesus died. And that's what they did. So they're not too wedded themselves to the authority of the scriptures. And yet they're far ahead of some of the others. I think that's the best answer I can give to that. But I will say this, I'm not going to throw away the whole King James Version after 500 years of use because they put Easter there. Because there is no, listen, there is no English translation. We're speaking English, so this is linked to English. There's no English version or translation of scriptures that is false. The King James Version, when it comes to the matter of marriage, divorce, and remarriage, in Matthew 99, we'll talk about fornication. You King James say morality. Do you not know that you can be immoral without ever committing fornication? So it's too gen generic. That's not a good translation. I don't throw away the King James Version because of that. But it says pornea. The Holy Spirit used the Greek term pornea. That's sex relations outside the marriage union. He didn't say immorality because you can engage in all sorts of immorality without engaging in pornea. So you don't have any English translations that are flawless and could be improved on. You do have translations. Some of them are far off base because of that. You so-called translators and uh, their whole philosophy of translating. Therefore, it behooves us to be cautious about what we do. But I want to bring this up because this is certainly one of the things we brought up against the King's version is they didn't translate. They used Easter, but if they translated, they would use Passover. So we need to keep that in mind. Now, we, came, we bring the lesson down to its end. And we've always strived to prove it. To speak with the Bible, speak to be silent with the Bible, be silent. To off the Bible thing, the Bible thing, the Bible thing, the Bible ways. This is another way of saying any man speak, let him speak his oracle from God. Listen, that's the way that's right. You cannot be wrong. Jesus is a sovereign. The church is not a democracy. Jesus' word is law. We need to be careful lest we're led astray by other people. As Paul said in Galatians, in Galatians 4 10 through 11, I'm not afraid of you. You observe days, months, times, and years. And he said, I'm afraid of you. Unless I bestow upon you labor in vain. The Lord's people, the Lord's church, the kingdom of Christ, the body of Christ, true Christianity. We don't have a Christian calendar. We don't have a Christian flag. The world often does, as far as the non-racial world. The New Testament knows nothing about St. Valentine's Day, Mardi Gras, which is also mixed up in this same season. Advent, Ash Wednesday, Lent, All 
Sunday, Holy Week, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Easter Sunday, St. Andrew's Day, St. Patrick's Day, All Saints Day. I think they're running out of names when they came up with All Saints Day. So they get them all together. Now, let's not think about Christmas or Epiphany or Twelfth Night on and on and on. So I said, well, what's wrong with it? Simple. Jesus Christ, our Savior, has all authority in heaven and earth, never put it in His Word to guide us. And we're to do only as He authorized, and we must know the words of Christ to do it. It's that simple. Now, when you begin to determine you want to do things your way because of the Bible, let us say so. You'll never have the unity for which Christ prayed and which is commanded in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10. It is the same night, the same judgment. There will never be what was the first century church that you read in your own testament if you read it. So I close today saying we are set on a course to speak what the Bible speaks, to be silent what's silent, to call the Bible things the Bible names, to do Bible things in Bible ways, that the New Testament is a divine infallible blueprint and we act only on its authority. Because someday that book will be open to them judgment. Each one of us will stand before the judgment bar of Christ. It'll read then even as it reads now, and it won't mean then what it means now. And we will give an account of the deeds done in the body in the light of that divine standard. It won't change. Christ is not going to say, well, I gave you this to follow. I'll put a different book out on you and then judge you and give you an account for that. No. Christ is true to what he says. We can trust him based on his word. If you're not a child of God, we urge you to believe in Christ. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in Christ. And be here to hold in baptism. To attain the remission of sins and thereby become a Christian. A child of God, do you let your feelings and notions of life and this life lead you to too much? We can see what it did to people going back almost 2,000 years ago when they decided to leave the mind back. They went whatever way their thoughts and feelings led them, and people still do today. If you need to repent of sins as a child of God, you're to do so. Confess that you will pray God for forgiveness. Please respond to the truth of Christ before we stand and sing.